We're continuing um, our series in the book of Psalms, and it's been a really great time. I think we're learning so many good things. It's a very practical, down-to-earth series. Um, the book of Psalms is just so much, so full of encouragement, so loaded with, with golden nuggets that, that boost our spiritual life, our strength, our confidence. And if you have your Bible, let's open to Psalm 46. That's the psalm that Victor read for us earlier. We'll be looking at Psalm 46. Uh, but before we do that, uh, I wanted to bring in a little example from uh, the Silver Chair, which is the sixth book uh, in the book of Narnia, uh, in the book series, C.S. Lewis's Narnia series. And uh, it's a very interesting little story. And it starts with this uh, is basically about a girl named uh, Polly, I think. Um, and is it Polly? Yeah. And her friend Eustace, and they go on this adventure uh, to free a prince uh, in, in Narnia, a prince who was kidnapped, and he needs to be restored back to his kingdom. And in the beginning of the story, uh, Polly, the girl, is given... Um, some instructions as she meets the lion, Aslan. He's kind, of, he's kind of the Christ figure in the story, the God figure, and he's the creator of Narnia. And as Aslan is sending her on this adventure, on this mission, he, he, he tells her that uh, he gives her six or, or five or four, I think, signs, and those signs are supposed to guide her on this journey, Right? He sets her on this mission, but he gives her these signs, and these signs are going to be kind of like the guideposts so that she doesn't get lost. Her friend and her don't get lost. And he says these words at the beginning before he sends her off. He said, but first, remember, remember, remember the signs. Say them to yourself when you wake up in the morning and when you lie down at night and when you wake up in the middle of the night. And whatever strange things may happen to you, let nothing turn your mind from following the signs. And secondly, I will give you a warning. Here on the mountain, I have spoken to you clearly. I will not often do so in Narnia. Here on the mountain, the air is clear and your mind is clear. As you drop down into Narnia, the air will thicken. Take great care that it does not confuse your mind. And the signs which you have learned here, they will not look to you as you expected them to look when you meet them there. That's why it's so important to know them by heart, to pay no attention to appearances. Remember and believe the signs. Nothing else matters. Kind of gives her this like stern talk as he's sending these two children on this adventure. And he says, it's going to look different down there. Remember these signs, or you will get lost. And in many ways, I think that uh, what Lewis is capturing here is that uh, our spiritual journey, our spiritual life, in many ways, it, it's, a, it's a battle of perspective, right? We, we, we are always confronted with how we think and how we see the world. We ask the questions, do you believe in God? Uh, do you believe that God is good? Do you believe that God is powerful? Do you believe that God provides for his children? And we say, yeah, of course I believe those things. I'm a Christian, right? But then we get down into the land and, and the daily adventure hits and, and things are not perfect and messy and sloppy and our understanding becomes more complicated, right? We're, we're challenged to veer off from the things we say we believe so clearly, right? We fear and we struggle and we stress and we do that in everyday life, right? And, and we're always trying to work this clear truth of God into the messiness and fogginess of our daily life, right? And, and very often, if we're honest, you know, Sunday morning is so great. We sing God's praises. We hear the sermons. We're so encouraged. Monday morning hits, and Monday morning is hazy. Um, you know, Monday morning is tough. And, and, and these truths that we confess so clearly... We have a hard time feeling that they are real and present and relevant sometimes, right, in our daily lives. 
We, we, we often maybe fail to see these things like the Lord is God, right? Simple truth. But when we get hit with everyday life, we, we start to, we, we don't question it consciously, but we struggle to see that this truth is relevant in this moment, right? In this moment where I, while I'm in the kitchen, in this moment while I'm driving to work in traffic or trying to meet deadlines, Right? We say we believe things, and we do believe them, but then our emotions, our will, our thoughts, our heart kicks into a series of habits that we don't even think about, right? And, and what, what this highlights is that faith, the process of faith, it's not just a simple thing. It's, it's a tricky thing. Faith is, is a little bit complicated. You can say you believe something, and you genuinely believe it, and then everyday life pulls you in other directions, and, and, and you see that your heart believes other things at the same time as your mind believing the Word of God. It's kind of like one example that I've seen, Tim Keller said that once, it's kind of like, uh, I think maybe our younger generation might not even connect with this, but back in the day, there was such a thing as soda machines, and you put change in them, and you click a button, and the soda thing pops out. I think we still have them around, but I, I don't think anybody uses those. But sometimes those soda machines would be standing in like an old neighborhood or an old little mini mart and they're standing there for a long time. They don't work very well and you put your quarters in and then you hear that it didn't drop, right? You click the button, I want the Pepsi and nothing's happening, right? And you got to bang on the side and then you hear click, click, oh, it dropped. Now I can get my soda. Sometimes truth works like that, right? You get the truth in your mind and you're like, yes, I believe God is my king. God is my Lord. God is my stronghold. But, but everyday life hits, and it's like the change hasn't dropped into the heart, and the heart is still anxious, the heart is still distracted, and we need that process. So, so our daily spiritual life is a process of merging, merging, right, this paradox of what we know about God and the chaos of everyday life. And that's what we want to see as we look at Psalm 46. The, the essential thing that we want to see as we look at this psalm is that the core truth at the center of everything you confess and believe, the core truth is how you see God, who is God. And the core battle, as simple as it sounds, is you merging the reality of who is God with the reality of my daily chaos and imperfection and messiness of life. So as we look at the psalm, I want to I wanna point out a couple of characters, a couple of things uh, a truths that this psalmist is highlighting to show us, right? The psalm is all about seeing God as our refuge. It starts in verse one with these words, God is our refuge and strength and helper who is always found in times of trouble. There's a confidence in the psalmist, right? There's a confidence here. And, and as he is looking at it, and he says, therefore, we will not be afraid, though the earth trembles and the mountains topple and the depths of the sea, into the depths of the seas, though its waters roar and foam, the mountains quake and it, with its turmoil. So he's saying, God is my stronghold, and I will not be afraid, even though all this chaos around me can boil and, and, and come to the surface, right? He's, he's rooting himself in this one truth, God reigns supreme and undisturbed. God reigns, no matter what happens in life, right, God reigns supreme and undisturbed. Guys, you can click the slide. This little clicker is having trouble today. Um, his confidence is contrasted with the chaos of the world around him. In contrast to these raging seas, melting mountains, right, this chaos, right, he's pre presenting something that he sees the psalmist, he's not, being, uh, he's not being escapist. He's not like, oh, I'm not going to pay attention to the chaos. No, he's saying, though the mountains are raging and the waves are raging and mountains are melting, right? He sees his life. He sees the chaos. But behind the chaos, he sees a bigger fact. God is reigning. God is in charge. God is on his throne. And this truth, it comes out full force in verse 10, right? In verse 10, it is God speaking to the world, right? And he says these words, as Victor read, stop your fighting and know that I am God. Other translations translate it in a way that maybe we've heard more commonly. Be still 
and know that I am God. And I like, I like how he, uh, um, the CSV translates it, stop your fighting, because it's, it's highlighting this little thing, right? It's showing this picture. God is on his throne. God is in charge of the world. And below him, the world is doing its thing. People are living their dramas. People are immersed in their conflicts, in their fights, in their, in their, in their issues, right? And God speaks down into the world, and God is trying to show them something that is very key to their view of life, uh, uh, something that they are totally missing, right? So often, th- this is what happens, right? We're limited little human beings. We have one brain that has a limited capacity, and when we focus on our life, most often, th- the problem that's right in front of me this week is the thing that dominates my entire horizon, right? This is it, this big project, this deadline, or this struggle, or this conflict with this person, right? And, and, and we fit God into kind of our little story, our little vision, as, as a helper or as somebody who's supposed to answer a prayer and help me in this problem. But me and my problems, that's the main thing, right? And what God is saying in this picture, he's saying, hey, everybody, stop your fighting. Stop your raging and realize I am the king above all of this. I am the God who reigns. God is kind of speaking into this world, and he's saying, like, our world is full of people fighting each other for which one of them is God, right? Which one of us is the little God that rules the world? We, 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 we fight with our conflicts, with the nation's rage. We have wars and politics and different leaders, right? The world is full of Everybody clamoring for their place, trying to prove themselves. And God is speaking into this chaos, and he's saying, hey, guess what? None of you are God. I am God. And I am exalted in the nations. I'm exalted in the whole world. So what we have to see what he's doing here. He's not trying to convince the world that he is God. He is presenting to the world that he is God. This fact that doesn't need anyone's validation right? The world can be consumed in its chaos, distracted, ignoring that God is God, but God speaks into the world and says, I'm trying to tell you a fact of reality. Nothing disturbs my lordship. Nothing disturbs my reign, my position, right? God refers to being above everything, as powerful, as in control of all things, that he is is unaltered. He is not touched by anything that is happening down here. It's really important to catch what he's trying to say here, right? The, this, is, this is something that theologians call God's transcendence. God is transcendent. What does that mean? It means that he is above all things in a way that his power, his authority, his control is not impacted at all by anything that happens in this world. Completely untouchable. That does not mean, of course, what we want to oftentimes jump into a ditch of saying, does does that mean that God is just like detached from reality? He's just up there in the heavens, right? No, that does not mean that. We'll see that in a second. It's highlighting a characteristic of God that we often forget, that God is his power, sovereignty, and reign, his purposes, his goals, they're, they're, they're unshakable to anyone or anything in the created universe, he reigns. No matter what happens, he reigns. Look at the couple of other passages from the Psalms. Next slide. Psalm 2, we heard this a couple of weeks ago, right? He says, the kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and against his anointed. And they say, let us tear off their chains and throw their ropes off of us. And then verse 4, the one who is enthroned in the heavens laughs. Right? It's, not, it's not making a joke, but it's trying to highlight this simple fact. It is silly for humans to try to think that they can impact the reign of God, the power of God. God is in the heavens, and He laughs at the plans of the people who try to pull Him down. Or Psalm 93, next slide, David just proclaims this truth. You got to hear this, he says, the Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed, enveloped in strength. 
The world is firmly established. It cannot be shaken. Your throne has been fully established from the beginning. You are from eternity, right? So here we see the psalmists, they're thinking, they're focusing, they're highlighting the simple trait of God. God is transcendent, and His reign is untouchable. His purposes are unshakable. Have you ever stopped to consider the stability of God, right? It's a very important question. Do we, do we ever stop and, and, and really let this truth soak in, this simple fact that God is in control, that God reigns, and that nothing all, can alter that fact, right? We, we stress, we worry, we fear about this thing right in front of me, this job, this relationship, this conflict, this opportunity, this problem, this deadline, right? Whatever the thing right in front, and when we think that these things in front of us, they're such a big deal. And, and in a sense, they are because life matters, right? But in a sense, when you zoom out and you realize, guess what? Like if I fail today, if I totally blow it, if I, if I mess up or make a fool out of myself or whatever, if I don't meet the demands for myself that I think that I should, God is still Lord. He is still reigning. He is still sovereign. And His purposes will not be hindered. Do we ever stop and consider just these simple facts? Nothing surprises God. Nothing stresses Him out. Nothing ever causes God to fear. Nothing ever threatens God. There's, there's a profound and powerful comfort and an essential comfort that gives us that anchor in our spiritual life when we learn to anchor ourselves down to this fact. The Lord reigns, and no one and nothing can stop that. This is the only thing that can truly anchor our life. This is the only place. This is where the psalmist, he's, he's wrestling with the chaos of the world, but he says, I have peace. Why? Because I anchored to this fact. This is the God I believe in. This is the God who calls out to the nations and says, stop your fighting and know that I am God. But notice there's a, there's a second emphasis here, right? In the next slide, we see that we, we see another truth highlighted about God. We see that God is, it's highlighted here that God is reigning, but we also see that God loves and dwells among his people. Notice this center section in the psalm, verses four to seven. The psalmist says this. He says, there's a river. Its streams delight the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is within her. She will not be toppled. God will help her when the morning dawns. Nations rage, kingdoms topple, the earth melts when he lifts his voice. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. So notice that the psalmist is counterbalancing with this truth of God's transcendent. God is untouchable in his power and his reign and his authority, right? Counterbalanced with that, we also see a big emphasis in this psalm that God is present among his people. This beautiful picture, he says, the river that flows through the city of God, and this river gives life and blessing to the people of God. That river is the presence of God, the goodness of God. It's presented as a river that nurtures, that cares for, that provides, right? And it's highlighting this, this God who is reigning supreme. This God is dwelling among loving, saving, and protecting his people. God's presence and his love is presented here as something that is unstoppable, unalterable again, right? And it's quietly flowing. It's, it's contrasting to the chaos of the world. There's a quiet presence of God that loves and gives life to his people. Why, why is this so important? Is because we see here that you see God's love being highlighted as a trait in the context of God's power and unstoppable nature, right? So the reason that this God who is exalted above all the nations, we, we, we see this God, right? He is exalted, he is 
powerful. He melts all things when he just speaks, right? And, and what does this God do? What is his priority? What is his heart? What, is he, what does he focus himself on? This God who is transcendent, this God who is untouchable, this God, his heart is set to love his people, to dwell among his people, to be present among his people. He is unstoppably committed to being close and caring for the people who are calling upon him, the people who are trusting in him. I think a lot of our, we were talking about this in our groups, a uh, couple of the group discussions this week, as we were thinking about trusting God and difficulties in life, I think that we probably, even though we probably don't fully acknowledge it, most of our struggles, they boil down to two main questions that we ask about God, right? Is God really in charge or is my life random? And then question two, can God be trusted, right? Is the universe just a random battle? Is life all up to me? Is there a point to everything, right? And, it, and if there is a God, why, why is all this bad stuff happening? Why are there so much people getting hurt? Why is my life so complicated sometimes? Does God care about me? Why does God feel distant, right? Is he the kind of God, I think this is the ultimate question for us, is God the kind of God that I can rest and trust in even though I don't fully understand everything? Right? Because that's the, that's, the, that's the center of our human dilemma. We are little people, and we will never grasp life, all of it. Life is so big, complicated, challenging. If you try to take on this task of understanding all of your problems, understanding all of your relationships, all, understanding all of your challenges and your goals, grasping and controlling, you will go crazy. But, but then we, we, we ask this question, but can I really rest? Can I sleep and have peace Resting in God. Now, when we look at, you know, how people deal with these questions, it's interesting because our tendency is always to pull on one of these two attributes that we've highlighted. God is either less powerful and authoritative than we think, or God is less loving and present than we think. Our, our culture has all these different ways of, of trying to say, you know, <clears throat> like one theological idea among people who call themselves Christians, you know, God... Uh, God, is, God is so loving and so caring. He's so present. You know, all these bad things that happen, he doesn't fully control everything. Uh, he doesn't fully know all of the future. Or he's not in control of the future. But God is with you. God is for you. God loves you. And he's doing his best, right? The other, the other extreme is people fall into is just feeling detached from God and being like, ah, God doesn't care about me. I'm too broken. I'm too messed up. I'm too uh, detached. Uh, he doesn't care about me. I don't feel like God is present and close in my life. And that means because I don't feel that he is present, because I don't feel that he loves me, that means that he is distant, right? So, so our human heart will always go in one of two directions. We will always try to question God's supremacy and transcendence and power and untouchable strength. Or we will question God's care and love for us. And we're always trying to make it fit into our human thinking by, by, by lowering one of these truths down, by making it more understandable, right? But this psalmist is showing us here that, that real peace. He's saying, we will not fear, we will not be afraid, though we see the threats of life, right? The, 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 the center, the, the key is to see these two truths about God as together, as inseparable, to, to, to acknowledge the mystery of this God that we believe in, the God of the Bible, who is infinitely exalted, who is infinitely above all things, who cannot be altered, who cannot be shaken, and yet this is the God who is above all things. This is the God who is unstoppably committed to dwelling with us, to saving his people, to coming to the rescue of his people, to working with broken sinners, and committed to loving and restoring and working with us, right? God is trustworthy. How do I know God is trustworthy? He is trustworthy only because... He is the God who is transcendent, right? You cannot rest in a God who is not completely, fully above all things 
and in charge of all things. And it's interesting because when you look at when we look at the the truth of Scripture, um, the Bible is the only religion, the only idea, the only perspective on God that presents God as infinitely exalted and infinitely close to us at the same time. So as we see these two characteristics, we also need to hear, third of all, this invitation that the psalmist gives us. Next slide. We need to hear the invitation that is being given, right? When we think, yes, God is exalted and God is loving. Well, what if I don't feel like he is? What if I feel like God is distant? What if I feel like I don't have this confidence, right? Or what if I feel like when I, when, I, when I get down to actual daily life, I don't have that motivation, that inspiration to read my Bible and to grow and to pray and to seek the things of God, right? What do I do with myself in light of these truths if I don't feel compatible with these truths? And there's two commands here, and these two commands are kind of like part of one process, right? Verse 8. Come and see the works of the Lord, who brings devastation on the earth, who makes war to cease through the earth. He, sh- he shatters bows and cuts spears to pieces. He sets wagons ablaze. Verse 10 again, stop fighting and know that I am God, exalted among the nations. So, so he's, he's pres- these two twin calls, these invitations, come and see the works of the Lord. Come and see what God does. Set your heart, set your mind on who God is to know him, right? As we said earlier, one of our biggest challenges is this challenge of perspective, right? We build our lives when we get into maybe the complexity of faith. Why is faith so complicated? Uh, We build our lives around what we feel inside, right? And, and, And in a sense, that is true, right? You can't live a life where your mind is detached from your emotions, right? We don't, we don't say that emotions don't matter, right? But the problem is, we often go a little bit to the extreme. We, we go to the extreme of my emotions and my experiences about God today, about my spiritual life, about my struggles. This starts to dictate how my spiritual life goes, right? It's easy to say I believe in God. It's like, it's like Aslan says, these are the signs, but when you get into the land, things get messy and, and you, you're, gonna, you're gonna forget the signs, right? So it's easy for us to say I believe in pow- God's power and protection, but when you're looking at your bank account and there's nothing there and you don't know where money is gonna come from, it gets really hard, right? It's easy to say that we believe in discipleship, we believe in Christian community, but, but when we start to reach out to people, when we start to talk to people, we start to open up our life, it, it's awkward, it's complicated, it's uncomfortable, and, and, and we're really tempted to just run back to our individualism, right? Or it's easy to say that God is my only hope, I, I, God is my only shelter. It's easy to say that, but when you are experiencing a lot of anxious feelings or feeling really depressed, you don't know why, right? There's a collision between what I'm knowing about God and what I'm feeling. And here we see this, the power of this invitation. What do I do? Come and see the works of the Lord. Consider who God is and what he has done, right? Scripture calls us to live our lives rooted into facts, right? Not the facts about what is swirling in my heart. The facts, first of all, of the God who holds the universe and he is unaltered. He does not change. He doesn't depend on how I feel today, right? My spiritual life must learn to be grounded in facts. And what that highlights is, uh, next slide, that faith is an active thing, right? Oftentimes we think, oh, faith is just like just believing and trusting. We hear this thing, faith is a gift of God, right? But when we say faith is a gift of God, we do not mean that faith is a passive thing, right? You are always actively putting your faith in something. And and to grow in faith in Jesus, to grow in faith in the God of the Bible, it is a very active process. It It is a process of constantly, constantly shifting your trust 
constantly trust, or questioning where, where your allegiance, where your peace, where your, where your strength lies, right? It includes us constantly stopping in, li- in the middle of our daily lives, right? It's like in this psalm, in the middle of the fight, God says, stop and know that I am God. Real faith, real faith in the God of the Bible, it, it calls us to do this. It calls us to actively learn, to have a habit in our life, to stop and ask ourselves, do I see above all things right now God? Do I believe, do I actively include in my perspective of this challenge today, God is reigning? And God who is reigning over all the universe, he loves me and he is working in my life. It's kind of like constantly questioning how, there, there's one story about a guy who is, is like a, a crime story about one guy running away from other people who were trying to manipulate him, and he woke up in a hospital bed one morning, and he was told, you were in a terrible accident, and um, see, look at these pictures, your back is broken, you can't move, and all these things, and he's like, wow, crazy, I don't remember anything. But as the process goes, he realizes that he's actually been captured by somebody who's been trying to capture him and get information from him. He realizes the whole hospital room is fake. He realizes the window and the sunlight is fake. It's just light bulbs outside of the wall. And, and he has to break out, and he's actually in a warehouse. In, in our process of growing in faith, you constantly have to do that. You have to actively stop and realize, and wait, what am I believing today? Do, do I actually see above all things, above the chaos in my life, do I see, do I acknowledge the Lord is exalted? He is reigning. And guess what? Nothing can stop his reign in my life, his love and his care for me in my life, his plan for me in my life. At the core of everything is this, this simple question, right? Who is God? And what is he like? And, and scripture is constantly calling you back to this one simple God, this one simple question. Have you considered God today? Right? So in this sense, faith is active. It, it, it is you clawing your way out, breaking down the walls of your heart, of your perspective, of your emotions, and letting the light in and seeing the real picture of who God is. And, and in the sense, it is, next slide, it's an active passive right? Because what, what are we called to do? We're actively called to be still. We are actively invited, be still and know that I am God. Biblical faith is an active process of stilling yourself before the truth of who God is. And when we learn to do this, we are, we are learning to rewire our heart of which, which direction do our emotions go, right? Is my view of God v- dictated by my emotions or is my view of God dictating my emotions, right? We, we've maybe experienced this in, um, in a relationship, in friendships, or especially in marriage, right? We have seasons where when you experience the un- the unquestionable care of another person. Um, we've, we've, we've all been maybe in relationships where the person that you're in friendship with or maybe in, in your marriage, your spouse is always, uh, is always trying to make you something else, right? You can't just, you can't just rest, even, uh, even on, a, on a difficult day, you can't just rest and be yourself because you feel like you always need to live up to a certain expectation, right? And if you say this thing or if you act this way, the person will be, upset at you, and they won't love you as much, and the relationship is always kind of rocky, right? And maybe some of us have also experienced the opposite, where you, you, you start to experience over time that this person, they just care about you, no matter what, right? They care for you, they're, they're here for you, and you can just kind of rest. I mean, that's what friendship is all about. That's what real love in marriage is supposed to be all about, right? And we understand that there's this deep stabilizing power where I'm not trying to put on some sort of picture for this person. This person just takes me as I am, right? But have we considered God and his stability towards us, right? Have we considered the fact that before we were even turning to God, had any ideas about God, right? God purposed the plan of redemption. God came into the world. God suffered and died, 
right? God laid out, God calls us all to the table today. God is exalted, he is unaltered, and he cannot be changed in his affection for his people. So our daily process is always reversing this flow. When I feel down, confused, anxious, struggling, right, I I tend to project those emotions back onto God and everything else. And somebody asks you, how's your spiritual life going, right? How how are you doing, right? Very often what what we respond probably is something along the lines of how am I feeling about myself and about God and how am I projecting those feelings back out, right? But but what what the psalmist is calling us here is, is, is backwards, Sometimes we need to pause and just to realize, man, you know, I'm a mess, I'm struggling, right? But God is still my savior. God is unstoppably my savior. The only way that God is going to cease to be my savior is if I consciously want, decide that he never was my savior and that I'm leaving him and hating him, right? And, and even in that situation, most of us, we're not in that phase. Most of us, our daily struggle is, is God really pleased with me today? Is God really with me, right? We feel discouraged, we feel down, right? When we look at the cross, when we look at the gospel, do we consider this simple, unstoppable reality that for those people who call themselves Christians, right, for those people who call upon the name of the Lord, They will be saved. For those, Jesus says, everybody who comes to me, I won't cast out. If you are a follower of Christ, no matter how messy and and imperfect you are, do do we realize nothing that I do impacts his stable, present love? It's like it's like that river that's quietly flowing through the city, but you try to stop that river, you realize it's unstoppable, right? There's a power, there's a force. Nothing that I do, nothing that I accomplish, nothing that I project, none of your ministries, none of your uh, successful parenting, none of your successful business uh, adventures, none, none of your successful relationships and loving people and going on missions trips or doing whatever, none of the, how much you read your Bible, how much you pray, think about this. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you have put your faith in Christ, nothing that you do is making God more cared about you because he's already, he's already given himself to you completely, right? Nothing that I do is going to make the church better from my power. Nothing that I do is going to save the people around me. It's only God and his kingdom, his purposes, and nothing can stop him, right? God reigns. God is supreme. It's almost as if you know, we, 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 oftentimes maybe we complain, God, you feel so distant. God, you feel so this and that. And, and it's almost when we read passages like this, God is answering and saying, who told you I was distant? Who told you I was judging you? Who told you I was angry at you, right? Who told you I was uh, judging you and wanting you to be better, Right? Now, in a sense, of course, we're not saying that, oh, well, just do whatever we want. God doesn't care about obedience. Of course, God calls us to obedience, to loving him, right? That's the other side of love. But, but, but the foundational fact is, do I see God as somebody that I need to please in my life as something I need to build, or do I stop and I rest in just the simple fact of God's stable lordship and his love in my life? Too often we base our spiritual life on how we feel about God rather than how God feels about us in reality, right? And so the psalmist here, he's presenting this truth. He's presenting, he's trying to say to the whole world, he's saying, in the midst of the chaos, do you guys know that God is Lord? He is reigning over the universe. He holds the world in the palm of his hands. He cannot be altered. He cannot be shaken. He is not surprised. He is not stressed out by anything. And this mighty, terrifying God, this God is infinitely, unstoppably committed to his people. He is a river of blessing to those who call upon his name. The the feeling of peace 
and stability. It arises when you hear the call. Stop. Consider who he is. Consider God. Before you consider yourself, before you consider all of your imperfections or how your spiritual life needs to go or what you need to do before you can come to God, you know, that's the other thing is like, People raised in the church, oftentimes it's a complicated psychological thing about like, am I following Jesus or am I not? Did I have this conversion experience? Did I have these emotions? Am I praying with my, or singing with my hands up? What if I'm not as emotional as the guy next to me about the gospel? You know, we get all this weird, complicated, psychological emotions about our faith because we're basing our Christianity on ourselves and people around us. But when we hit the anchor, When we hit the heart, we realize everything flows down from one fact. God is Lord. He is a savior to his people. And if you call upon his name today, he is your savior. If you stop and you turn from your sin and you say, I don't want this sin. I know that I have habits that I I keep turning back to, it, but deep down, I don't want this. I want this Lord. He is yours. He invites all, right? Right? And it is a profoundly simple invitation. And oftentimes, the biggest piece is to stop in the midst of your struggles, right? And just to realize, man, I'm so glad that he is still my savior, even though I'm such a mess today, right? He doesn't abandon me. He doesn't do anything, right? He's, he's, he's died on the cross. Today, the, the table is kind of a picture of all this, right? We come here, we're all imperfect, we're all complicated and and, and confused and in our different ways, right? But the one requirement for this table, the one requirement is that you seek the Lord from the heart, that you are not hiding sin from from, from people. You're not being a hypocrite. You're not being a fake. You're not saying, oh, yeah, I follow Jesus, but no, I follow my sin instead. If you're genuinely here to follow Christ, if if, if that's your heart as a Christian, being baptized and professing his name, right? We are all welcome to the table. The the table is in many ways kind of a picture of the steady, steadfast, untouchable reign of God in our lives today. So a couple of application questions for us as we're we're praying, as we're uh, reflecting. What are the voices that are shaping your reality today, right? There's different voices that shape my little view of reality, my emotions, my fears, my past, my future, the world around me, the news, politics, social media, entertainment, work, deadlines, success, pressure, all these different things, they, they shape what I see in my vision of reality, right? Next question. Have you ever truly considered the transcendent character of God? Have, have you ever truly paused to consider that God is unstoppable, untouchable, perfectly at peace, perfectly in charge of all things. Has that truth ever soaked into your heart? Next question. Do you see God as both, essentially both, transcendent and exalted and deeply present today? When we look at the cross, we get the answer to that, right? The exalted Lord came to suffer and die for us. The cross is a historic footprint of the fact that God who reigns, is here to save. Do you consider that? Do you you marvel at the beauty of this mystery that God is both infinitely above and infinitely close to me? Do, Do we marvel at that? Like, wow, that's amazing. This God, he's amazing. Next question, do you see faith? Do you see your daily faith? as an active process of constantly breaking down the walls of your personal mental vision of life and letting in the light of the presence of God, the reality of God, to determine our heart and our mind. To all the raging nations, right, God says, stop your fighting and know that I am God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that it doesn't matter what we do. We thank you, Lord, that today, even if we come to church with a wrong mindset, you are still here to give. You are still here to love. Even if we are distracted, even if we are 
week, even if we are anxious, we thank you, Lord, that you are the Lord of all the universe. And today, as Lord, you are here. You are present to save. You are here. You are present to redeem. We thank you for Christ, who is to us the perfect reminder and a perfect proof of your steady love towards us, Lord. We thank you for Christ, who is our anchor in this storm. The, the Christ who, who has come and has bled and who has ascended as Lord of glory, Lord, we thank you that this is our Savior. Lord, we thank you that in this truth we find the most mysterious and profound solution. We can rest, even though there's so much we don't understand. There's so much we can't grasp about life, about ourselves, even our own problems. Lord, we just, we thank you that, that you don't need us to be anything because you are the king, you are the savior, you are the one from whom all blessings flow. Lord, help us to learn to reverse, reverse our heart process daily. Help us to start with considering your majesty. Help us to start with considering your stability towards us in the world. Help us to learn to, to calm, to quiet our hearts, to actively submit to this beautiful truth. And for that process to begin to well up in us a deeper peace, Lord. We are afraid, life is hard. Help us to be anchored to you to have that real peace that the psalmist talks about here, that true, genuine peace that sees the challenges, but we, we rest in you who is above it all. Amen. 